Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this Future Part workshop. Um, we are incredibly excited that our Future Part research on privately owned public spaces is now in full swing. Um, we got back up to speed in May, and we have run two workshops, internal workshops, in June already. And this is our first open workshop. Um, and this is because we really want Future Part to be an open and interactive space. So we hope that you'll be able to join us for these types of workshops in the future. Um, just a little bit of an update for those of you who don't know me or recall me from the previous session, I'm Dr. Britt Bailey, I'm one of the POPs team. Um, we're really delighted to have some of our other POPs team members here in the audience today. So we have Mikara Naidu, um, Julia Carew, and Margot Adams. And at a distance we have, in addition to some of our other colleagues in other offices from BNP around the continent, we have our colleague Mark Chiari, who is based in our Nairobi office, who's also a part of this core team that's working on POPs. So in addition to the workshops, we've been doing a lot of base mapping um, for this project, really situating our studies in the actual context that we're working on in our case study sites. And we've actually begun our qualitative interviewing and cognitive mapping process this week on site. So we're incredibly excited about that. But because we're a learning entity and one that is trying to further our knowledge in as many ways as we can, we're delighted to be able to draw upon our colleagues um, who are experts in particular fields. And today we have Dr. Dion van, van Westhuizen, excuse me. <laughs> Clearly I'm not from South Africa. <laughs> um, but Dion has not only worked in South Africa. Uh, he was a Fulbright scholar in the US. He was also did his PhD at the University of Michigan. Um, he's worked on case studies in Detroit as well as uh, case studies across South Africa. He's really interested in looking at public space and how people actually use public space, um, as well as other spaces in our cities. And he's also very interested in the question of how are designs, the intentions behind designs, how do they actually match use and behavior in situ? And because our privately owned public space research is very much about that, how are people actually using these spaces, we really wanted to draw upon Dion's knowledge and some of his insight into what other people are doing in this field at the moment. What's the hot stuff off the press so that we can learn and further our own knowledge and methodology. So without further ado, Dion. Thank you. So thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, I'm, I, I love this new building. Um, I've actually been on a bandwagon for a few years about non-gendered bathrooms, so I'm very impressed. That's probably, been, probably my favorite part. Um, so I, I know a lot of you, so hi. So I hope I won't bore you with uh, a, lot, a, a lot of the work that you have actually engaged in. Uh, but that's going to be the focus of, of the talk today. Uh, I met with, uh, with Britt uh, a week ago to discuss what, what I should focus on because I have an interest and, uh, in public space and have done some work in, in mapping and doing interviews and, and also uh, transferred that into my teaching that a lot of the students also uh, picked up on those skills. Uh, so it was quite tricky to figure out which aspect of it I would like to focus on. So. What I would want to say is this approach is only a snapshot, I think, of what's needed for uh, developing a deeper sense and a good idea of, of how people use public space, how do we engage with design decisions in public space. And it really, really uh, asks for a, a mixed methods approach or a multiple methods approach to really get behind the issues. So the, the focus, I'm, I'm actually framing this this presentation on is to maybe show you a bit of skills of how do we actually do more quantitative work in understanding public spaces and that's why I called it behavior tracking and tracing behavior track and trace so I actually went to the site to the F&B site during the week and and actually thought while I was driving here I should actually call it behave track and trace um, but that was just my first impression of going to the site. So uh, as you can see, I'm uh, at Wits University, uh, School of Architecture and Planning. Um, 
I'm only a part-time lecturer there, have a very small practice, it's probably the size of one of your workstations, uh, just to keep me engaged in, in real life issues. Uh, but it's been quite a, quite a fun ride actually also working on this stuff with all uh, current and former students. So I hope you can see this. It just gives you an idea of some of the research that I've been involved in since 20, 2004 when I um, uh, moved to the States to actually become more uh, engaged in training as an urban designer and also research in, in urban design, which ended up being mostly, mostly the case, case with publications and reports that I worked on. Uh, on the side here, you can see BM uh, stands for Behavioral Mapping, Sur S, Surveys, TR is Trace, TS is, uh, no, traces, tracking is TR. So it just gives you a sense of, through, through the work, how multiple methods uh, can be used uh, to, to really look at issues from many perspectives, many points of views. If you do an observational study and you see people do certain things, you don't necessarily know why they're doing it, and therefore, deeper engagement on a qualitative level and talking to people becomes very important. Uh, so uh, a lot of this, most of this work actually was collaborative. Uh, so I started off with uh, collaborative work in uh, new traditional neighborhoods. It was right around the time when they started to build these, uh, uh, what, what is called new urbanist neighborhoods in North Carolina. And that's actually where I started my degrees. Um, all my studies and we looked at a few of those newly built uh, new traditional neighborhoods. Uh, do people actually use them the way that they were intended by, by the designers? And that's where a lot of the questions actually came out of. Then I also worked on, on quality of life studies. There was an energy conservation study on how do people actually use uh, office spaces. We did that at the University of Michigan. We also used traces what do people leave behind? How do they behave in their offices? Uh, there was a survey distributed to people in the building. Uh, and then from there on, it was mostly on a project in Detroit, uh, which later on I actually plugged my PhD work into that, uh, called the Lean Green in Motown. And it was looking at, at issues of uh, neighborhood design, uh, accessibility, pedestrian movement in terms of um, uh, health outcomes. So the idea was that if we can understand the environment and how it supports people to actually walk more, then they would actually have better health outcomes. And that went down from BMI to heart problems to all kinds of things that we had as part of this quite a comprehensive survey. Um, then when I returned to South Africa, there was a, a quick study that we did on um, the University of the Free State library to see how the spaces can be more uh, utilized better and we also used a lot of behavior mapping i'll show examples of that um, and then i mean the rest uh, further on as you can see here 2012 13 that's when we started with a lot of uh, the people in the room started to work on mapping public spaces and uh, trying to understand some of the issues around that I think what, uh, before I continue, if, I, if, I, if something doesn't make sense or I'm not loud enough, please just put up your hand or ask a question as I'm going along. Uh, one, of, one, of, one of the fears that you always have is when you're teaching is that glazed over look or someone can't hear you or what. So I'm not sure if it's actually projecting all the way to the back. Can you hear? Okay, good. Must be good acoustics. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, just as background, the influences through my studies, I actually initially went to North Carolina State University to work with Robin Moore, who, who is uh, the PI on the Natural Learning Initiative. His focus was primarily around children and children's environments, and oh, you, you should know that, uh, and how, how, um, children's learning can happen through the way that they play. And so, so a lot of the techniques that 
uh, uh, later years I applied myself and I, I teach the students uh, initially came from, from, from the work that he did and his whole team. Uh, then the other person I was really interested in working there was Henry Sanoff, who's a, a guy in participatory design. Uh, you can see here on the right, uh, there's this book called Games, Design Games, and he designed in the 60s. He's, he's like this uh, really interesting, sort of laid-back hippie kind of guy and designs these games that people would then uh, engage with the design process all throughout and then uh, actually get the outcomes and the uses out of design that they want. Um, from Bob Marins, I learned a lot about survey design and sort of bigger quality of life issues. Linda Grote was my, my direct supervi supervisor on my PhD, uh, who wrote the books on research methods, and then Jean Weinman, uh, with her skills in, in applying space syntax theory, uh, was also quite a significant person in my, in my doctoral work. Um, there was one other person I would like to mention, is the, the work of Peter Batchelor, who actually came from that old school of mapping at uh, the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, we applied these sort of what he called reductive mappings, which I think is a very useful way of thinking about mapping. And often we want to map too much. We want to put everything on a map. And it's actually about the process of being considered about what you draw and what you extract in terms of your mapping. So his approach was these very simple black and white line drawings uh, but they're quite intentional in what you would like to show. And that gets me to uh, one form of that. Here's just a sort of blow up of Cape Town. Is, um, and then the typical figure ground that we all know, it's very reductive, and, but you can actually read a lot of information in it. Um, here is some of the students at the University of the Free State did uh, a mapping of trees and all the kind of significant urban uh, gestures and uses that you can just read from a map, sort of a relational map of trees. Then um, you can also do correlational mapping, which is actually taking two factors that you extract, say the contours and um, the water system, and the first sort of blocks lay out for a town. And then just from those two or three factors, you can start to see uh, what are some of the essential ideas that gave Rose to... Um, to say a settlement. Then I also to told Brett I would like to show the group just this, uh, this technique by Jacobs, uh, Alan Jacobs, from his book Great Streets, which we always find useful in mapping urban related issues, uh, just in the way, also quite a reductive way of doing mapping, but the significance is it's only extracting the important features that show thresholds and also the thresholds between the inside and the outside of buildings. You can see here, you can just see the main space behind where you enter into a building. You can see where, um, where the entrances are. So it's a very deliberate uh, reductionist approach to drawing. And um, I, fi I find this in urban design uh, teaching in practice in uh, in the student work uh, in research this is quite a quite a useful tool okay so what what am I, am I focusing on today I've actually always thought about behavior mapping people tracking and traces as sort of three different things that would hopefully that you can layer over each other and uh, it would give you much deeper insight into what happens in public space um, but what we realized is if you actually combine all three of these methods, then you actually get, you're able to design a study that can extract the information that you want. Um, and if you, if you put them all together in a sort of more coherent sense, then you come up with, with what I think a group of us actually called activity mapping. Um, now, activity mapping is quite similar, and we actually took... Uh, took some inspiration from people like Peter Rich and those deeply uh, fine-grained use sort of architectural drawings, uh, practices like 2610, um, trying to remember who else, Karin Smuts, 
Uh, it's actually become a thing in South Africa to not just draw the architecture, but also draw the life that goes with it. And uh, we respect that approach, and we think that's, that's important. In research, it's a little bit different, because you need to actually back up what you draw with real data. And that, that's, that's the approach to actually combine these three aspects and then produce a map of what we call activity mapping. That's very much a real representation of what's going on on the site. So on, on these three things, I'm going to talk about what it is, how do we use it, how do we do it, which is probably the thing that you're also interested in, and then just uh, where we are in terms of what we're doing. Um, okay, so behavior mapping and tracking, uh, it's a technique been around since the 1960s. And I know <laughs> a lot of you are sitting here waiting for for that next next best thing. And this is completely not the case with quantitative work in public space. Yes, we do discover new technologies of how to represent, but the basics really remain the same. It's always been the same since, since that time, since the 1960s, and the world became a much more socially aware. And actually also this, this whole movement of environmental psychology, environment behavior, started to develop around, uh, around those times. So the innovation actually comes in the way that we collect data, that we can do it much quicker nowadays. We can use tablets and drones and, and all kinds of things. Um, but the sort of fundamental ideas of human use uh, remains the same. Um, so it is an approach that is uh, unobtrusive. So we actually don't engage with people. You actually just observe and see what they do. And the important thing, it's systematic. So you can very much, if you, if you throw out your entire protocol open to people, if you throw it open to people and you explain how did you actually design this protocol for your mapping, uh, then they can sort of believe you that the data that you've generated is, will be quite good. Um, the limitation, though, is it's good to reveal what's happening, but as I said, it doesn't really tell you you are making assumptions about what you see. Why are people interacting in certain ways? So you have to find other ways of extracting why people's intentions. Why are they actually doing what they're doing? It's their aspirations, perceptions, and they report on why are they. We have this, I have this discussion with, with Britt. If you, if you, uh, start to consider survey design and how people report things. There are all, always many, many issues. People all, sometimes, uh, or more than often, don't tell the truth. They might have reasons for why they lie, or they might not even know, or they can't remember correctly. So that's also not a foolproof way of really understanding why people do things. Uh, the wonderful thing in this, this, this sort of location-based understanding of of architecture is, is becoming really critical and that's what this kind of mapping uh, will do for you. It gives you real time and real space understanding of, of, of where and when things happen. Uh, it usually notes what people are doing, uh, in which direction people are facing, who they are. You again make assumptions about that and it also reveals some of the social relationships that, uh, that you observe in, in a public space. Okay, so, so it actually comes from this idea. So Ilse Wolf, uh, a few weeks ago, showed this image from her, her work pamphlet uh, of this, this lady building her own house. Uh, and she called it, I think she called it this idea of architecture from the inside out. So it's actually this lady building a uh, a uh, house out of sticks and the furniture is all arranged even with her child sitting inside while she's building this house around it. And uh, so that's what we obviously want to achieve in architecture, that there's such a fit between how we use spaces and what we design. So there's this, what I'm saying through behavior mapping and these, these sort of approaches, you start to understand space in, 
in terms of this. Now, I just want to step back to some of the studies by William White in the 1980s. Uh, he actually sort of perhaps unknowingly gave us this insight into space. So it shows some sort of plaza in New York that he mapped, and he pulled this entire grid over the space, which was quite interesting. Um, and then documented where people, I think, stopped or sat down, and, and those are the red dots. So then he added all these different other measurements and factors, maybe the sunlight, maybe it's the trees, maybe it's this, maybe it's the access points, all of that, um, to try to understand can he sort of predict where people would sit or slow down. Uh, but that's not why I'm showing you this image. This image is actually relevant in the sense that space in, in a public space, depending on where you define the boundaries, are quite neutral in the sense that life then happens and life in that space creates this idea around it that you see here with, with the house. And that there are spaces uh, in between where those thresholds between use areas or what they call behavioral settings, uh, that they are less used, but they are also useful. So that's for us to understand space in this way and in, in the way that, it, that it's actually sort of a grid pulled over a site is quite significant and that you can start to think about contrasting areas, low use, high use. Now, this also inspired this, the, the, this approach of pulling a grid over a site and thinking about each little tile as its own spatial entity, and that's what the work of the Space Syntax Group uh, do quite well. They've actually given us these tools to measure uh, for each and every little tile, for instance, how integrated is this tile in terms of all other tiles in the system of spaces, and you can see that quite clearly. Uh, the red spaces obviously are more integrated tiles in terms of all the other tiles that you see. So what they gave us is actually this measurement tool to see how space independently can also have an effect uh, on how people use spaces. And they actually find quite a lot of correlation between it. Now, now it's not the only factor, uh, but back in the day with the William White studies, this technology was not, not available yet. Then I've also added um, this study by Donald Appleyard, which I think is significant for specifically the F&B site. Quite a simple study, but it just shows that some of the other factors of, we always talk about attractors, that people are attracted to certain things in public spaces, and uh, that's where the use then happens, where, that's where the social interactions happen. But it's also what are the, the deterrents that create uh, psychological boundaries between different zones of public spaces and this study is quite useful for that uh, it shows the, the reported networks across the street uh, in a street with light traffic, medium traffic and high traffic and I was specifically thinking about that edge that you had on JP which is actually now scratched out How, what is that threshold that creates F&B Bank City on this side and a completely different world on the other side and it could be as simple as the, the amount of traffic. Um, then in terms of getting into a bit more into the detail of how people use what's called behavior, behavior settings. It's basically if you think about in a, in a design of a house that we design and we put a label on it. It's the sitting room. So that's where people should sit and it goes with certain behaviors. In a public space, it also works like a, like a house, except for those spaces are, they seem to be more loosely designed. Um, but people use areas in public spaces like a sitting room, like a kitchen, like a bathroom, like a, that's exactly how a public space is programmed in a sense. And that's what architects try to do. And I find this, this, uh, this case study here at the bottom that some of these people are actually discovered. So these platforms were designed at Walter Sisulu Square as um, 
trading spaces for uh, for for uh, for people, and and it's actually fairly close to the pedestrian routes. Uh, so the intention was that this is this is an object designed with a certain use affordance that people would actually take their stuff and put it on these platforms. It's it won't get wet because there's a roof, uh, so it just seems perfect. But what what students found is that people actually would put their stuff right next on the smooth pavement, right next to where people walk. And the design platforms are remain empty all the time. So it's quite a, quite a lot of money wasted on a design decision that people don't actually use. And this, this happens all over the... So the one thing is, uh, retail aspects should be close to a pedestrian route on the route of the pedestrian, right next to it. You don't want to walk five meters to get to it. It's right there where you're walking past. Uh, the other factor that we thought might be significant is actually the design of the floor texture, the rocks that stick out, and it's very difficult to actually navigate to the station. Uh, and there might be some, some other ideas, other reasons as well. Uh, the densities of the people, where the people, where people actually move across the site, etc. But the point is, we actually would not have found this if we didn't look at traces on the site and we didn't um, map uh, people's behaviour. Uh, then, just to throw this in, what are the kinds of uses or activities that are considered to be good? in a public space from Jan Giel's work, uh, also a project for public spaces, or PPS. Uh, you can see here, it's actually the best public space. The healthiest public space is the one that uh, allows for a lot of optional activities. So it's those things are, that are not planned for. It's uh, standing around, sitting, sunbathing, meeting new people, just watching and engaging in different ways from what, what, uh, what it's designed for. So there is this also this idea that there should be a looseness about public space. And I'm really just uh, putting this in for the research group as some background. And then also uh, Heel's work on thresholds and uh, contact, personal distance, is, is also quite useful. So I'm not going to talk about that much. In... Um, Okay, so this is now getting to, to my own work, so I'm mostly giving you examples of that at different scales. Behavior mapping can work at the neighborhood scale. So this is actually the first study we worked on in 2004 um, in uh, Southern Village, which was that new urbanist neighborhood, and we wanted to see how people uh, use it. Here you can see yard sales, sitting, biking, pool, and then also the frequency of those movement across the site and the locations of it. Now, um, when we talk about this methodologically, uh, the bigger the area, obviously, the fewer categories you can have, the more difficult it is to map, the more, more strict your protocol must be so you don't make measurement errors. Uh, so it actually becomes quite tricky to work on a neighborhood level. Then, um, this sort of craziness that came out of my PhD work was uh, behavior mapping in three different areas in Detroit. Each of those took, was a 50 kilometer mapping exercise in each neighborhood three times a day for three neighborhoods. So it adds up to 450 kilometers of mapping <laughs> per day. So. Uh, you ha you'll get therapy after that sort of exercise, <laughs> which I did. Um, but this is probably the biggest you can go on, on, a, on a sort of behavior <coughs> mapping by hand. So the way I did it was actually involve, we had a very strict route that we followed, time segments, uh, how we would drive and when we would drive through the neighborhoods and we needed to stick to those time segments. I had people from the community actually act as the drivers and they, they, they were actually driving the car and I mapped it on a, on a PC tablet at that time. And uh, then, then these sort of densities start to emerge in terms of use. Uh, I could only do moving or sed sedentary, that's it. No male, female, any other characteristics, just are you there or not? 
then um, for the student work, we actually started to think about those categories in a, in a much more sort of nuanced sense. And people started to make value judgments about whether people are females, walking, sitting, male, child, doing all these different things, and then also walking in different directions. But as you can see, the scale is much more manageable. This is Walter Sisulu Square. Uh, to start to, to map at uh, a reasonable rate, map those differences in terms of people. Um, and then the movement lines, that those are also uh, mapped. But remember, this can only be done if you have four or five people doing it. Uh, this is not something to, you cannot do it systematically unless you really balance the time sequence of the space versus the number of people that you have uh, to, to, to actually capture the data. So that's, that, that idea comes into, into how you design the study for, what, for the space that you're working in. Then the other, other mapping was in the, in the library, seven floors. Here you can see this is only one floor showing the use on, on the main floor. And one of the issues was they really needed some, some data on what is the use of uh, students studying in, in this space. And you can see you can never find a table here. Um, and then similarly the movement, what, what, what is interesting here is that we found a way to actually map uh, whether people are, students are walking alone, well, we don't know if they're students, but mostly students, uh, whether they're walking alone or walking in bigger groups, like between six or ten. So sometimes the group size and movement of the group size is also important to map. Actually, one of the first things I worked on was, was, was this study, and uh, part of the graphics, but <laughs> we, uh, I had to do it the night before, uh, this was actually as part of uh, Robin Moore's class on called Human Use of Urban Landscape. And I decided to, in a very conservative Raleigh, North Carolina, uh, go map uh, the gay club. And this is, this is the sort of intensity of mapping that you can do uh, through, throughout different time. You can see here, I was able to map what seemed to be couples or singles. And then later, as you go on at night, you, uh, you start to see other configurations of people uh, doing all kinds of things. Uh, <laughs> and then you can start to, through the theory of, of gay spaces, which uh, I, I actually read up a lot at that time, I was able to start to, to define these sort of behavior settings and actually give it names that link to the theory which is quite interesting. So, so this just shows you that certain, certain parts of buildings or public spaces really start to develop an identity around the kind of people that use it, what they want to do there. It, the, the, the architectural features are just right to support that kind of thing to, to happen there. So this is now at the small scale. So that's, and, and then you can even do a graphic like this. I mean, obviously it could be a lot nicer, but, but, but this sort of shows the different zones. Uh, intimacy circle, the cruising, the cruising uh, uh, route, and that happens all the time. I mean, it's quite interesting what you can extract from, from a behavior mapping. Um, okay. Uh, just a little bit about traces, because I think the, uh, the idea of trace is very important for, especially in the beginning, when you, when you, when you are designing the study to do behavior mapping, uh, to try to understand the groups, the people, um, how the spaces are used. Uh, you can't be on, in the space all the time, so also um, um, uh, how people use it when they're not there. You can see that through traces. And traces also have these different, different sort of ways that people engage with space. Uh, either they damage something or, or as a form of protest or just a way of navigating through, this, through the space uh, or reappropriating the space. Uh, and that's why I actually led you to the Zeisel book, Inquiry by Design, because I think that explains it quite nicely, the different ways in which people engage on a, on a trace level with, with the space. We even, we even did mapping of people walking in the snow uh, or just after the snow 
because that's such an easy way to do a sort of behavior map without having to actually physically map it because people mapped it for us. Um, but those, so, so, so those kind of traces are also, we all know the desire line, that, that is that piece of lawn that just won't grow because people walk on it over and over. So people vote with their feet. Um, yes, so I'm not gonna talk about more types of traces that start to talk about the, uh, the policing, the defensiveness, the territoriality of the environment and the relationship between the inside and outside. And if I can refer back to the Jacobs drawing, these things would be quite important, not just to show as an image, but also see it mapped, uh, to see it located on a map and how it actually relates to the other spaces. So the process must be, the, the point of doing quantitative and having a strict protocol is to try to get beyond individual biases uh, and measurement errors. Uh, not as easy to do, so that you can actually come up with reliable data that people can trust. Um, but let, let me just move on a little bit. Uh, okay, so how do we do it when you just start from scratch and you want to do behavior mapping, try to understand uh, the, how to do it for a specific site? You have to do a walkabout. You have to really engage with the site and get to know it. You can't design a study if you don't know the site. So there is basically a qualitative aspect that goes before, the, before any uh, sort of objective measurement of it. Uh, you have to start to identify the peak and the low use of different activities, uh, the types of groupings that you start to see, who are the people, where are they. Um, and then here in the study by Murray, this came out as quite an important thing. Who are the role players? Um, what are people's, what they call people's environmental roles? Uh, when, when they're on site, what do they act in? What groupings do they? Do they actually have a, a, a level of power to influence other people? Uh, how do people engage? All of those kinds of things. So focusing on the people that you see in the space. What are the different behavior settings? Here's an example. So it's all, uh, uh, it's all impromptu. We see this all over the place, but it's, we have sort of two scenarios here, space being taken up by informal selling. There's a very specific location of the person selling the stuff. Stan, you see this exactly in, in Johannesburg, even on your site, that people selling towards the pavement side stand with their back to the street. Uh, so this is very typical, and this is in Bloemfontein. And then the men standing in a row, which comes from William White's studies of public spaces, watching the girls go by. Um, but then there's also all the interactions between these groupings that you start, need to start to extract to understand how you would design your study. Okay, are there unique occurrences? This study by uh, Alex Thompson showed that this space... Bayes Nordia Square actually has this purpose to become a massive public space at certain moments in time. Uh, so how do you, do you want to map that or would you actually want to stay away from this unique occurrence on the site uh, and actually just capture the everyday use of it? So those are also decisions to, to keep in mind. Um, in terms of the traces that you see on site here, this is now on on the F and B site, uh, across the street, you see this kind of abortion and vandalism, and even in the texture of the paving, it's quite different from the texture and the paving on the other side, even though the security guards stand on, on either side. So they protect F and B even from, from the outside in. Uh, and then the smoker's environment is the most interesting thing, I think, about this site. Uh, it's actually their smoking areas seem to, I was only there for about an hour or so, but it seems to be just off of the main space, behind a solid wall to the back, and uh, despite having a, a big bin where they can put all the stompies, they actually throw it into the, next to the tree. So there are the traces of hundreds and hundreds of smokers socializing in those basically four corners just off. So the question would be why? Why are they 
there in the cold. Um, and there might, might be many reasons. They're far away enough from the cameras. They're not too close to the security guards. They're not in the space of, that where other people walk. Um, maybe, maybe they choose the solid wall so that their office employees don't see them smoking. Um, there, there might be many reasons. But I thought that was really interesting. Just, that's just from reading the trace, comparing this uh, planter to all the other planters. Um, the other aspect that was really interesting, uh, I followed a recycler. The recycling environment is also quite interesting because it's that person from the outside that somehow find their way through this privately owned public space uh, but they don't actually walk all the way through. They just get to a few important planter boxes to actually get what they need, and then they take a, a quick left turn. So those kind of things, do you want to map that role player in terms of the other role players? How does that interface with the positions and the, and the viewpoints of the security guards? Those are all quite important considerations. And then you develop a a systematic protocol, usually in, in the form of these sheets that uh, your writers or reviewers or mappers actually use on site. And uh, we've come up with something like this. Uh, you, can even, you can even find software now where you can do it digitally. Uh, I don't really see the point because, uh, I mean, this is, this is good enough. Uh, <laughs> uh, so it shows, I might have another picture here. It identifies mapping boundaries. So sections of the site, you, you really have to be like a horse with, with these blinders on, that you only focus on the zone that you are assigned to. So this is uh, Jubal Park. You can see it has four or five or six different zones. And you have five people actually working at the same time to map, to map the space. So if Julia is doing zone three, she should not be mapping someone in zone two. This is not a time to be creative. It's a time to be systematic. Um, um, <laughs> uh, and, and as you can see, there's a, there's a little key here for what we decided would be important things to map. So the direction of people, male or female, uh, are they standing, sitting, or lying down? Because there's, there's, a, there's a whole culture of lying down in Jabir Park. Uh, and then also, as, as a second mapping exercise, so you might do this, what, what they call the behavior mapping, so the dots of people. And then the second one is actually the movement parts. Uh, now, I don't have the example here. It's coming up. So that might be a completely separate thing that you do the second half hour of an hour of mapping. Uh, you don't do them simultaneously because it has a completely different protocol to it. Um, we did the same thing in the Sassel library. Uh, you can see here we also had different zones for mapping areas. And if I zoom in a bit, in, in our mapping protocol maps, we even showed where the observer should stand, that's P3, uh, P3 here, and then the sequence that they would take to move to while doing the mapping. Um, and this must happen at this mapping point, they should stand for two and a half minutes and then move to the next mapping point, do it for two and a half minutes, and then cut off. So it's like really being a machine. So what you're doing is you're actually systematizing your process that the natural patterns can reveal themselves, which is quite a powerful idea. Um, and then for this study, we had this sequence, uh, this sort of timetable of where people would be in different places, different zones. The other thing, you can't mess this up. You have to be there. Otherwise, all the data is useless. Um, here's for the public space study. You can see here from 7 to 7.10, that's observer one should be doing that, then take five minutes, um, and then between 15 and 25, and you have to do it to the second. Again, if you have the system in place, then the natural patterns will reveal themselves. So this is actually how I got students to, to map the library, is to actually pay them to do it. Uh, <laughs> um, 
Okay, so for the uh, Walters, no, what, what is this, uh, Jubab Park uh, protocol, we said it's necessary that the following observations of the given part are carried out uh, by a minimum of five observers. So at this time, we already knew we needed five observers. So the observer needs to be in a place where they can see the whole space. They can keep track of people that they've mapped and new people, that they don't double count people. And what is the protocol also from shifting when people shift from one zone to the next? Uh, that's also something that you need to find agreement in terms of the people mapping it. Um, perhaps if they move, then they get counted on the other side, which would be fine if, it done, if it's done consistently. If they decide not to do it, then that's also fine because it's done, it's done consistently. Um, what else? The tracking, uh, the tracking system was also, I think we had people located at every entrance point to the space and exactly at the same time, minutes, seconds, uh, they start tracking people. So the first person passing through would be the one that you track and then follow, am I correct? I think. And then you would follow them for say three minutes and then you would stop. If they stopped and paused, you would locate that as a dot in the space. Uh, usually the three minutes would be enough to actually see them through, through the space uh, all the way without just leaving a line there. So with those consistencies, then you can start to work with the data and actually come up with, with a, a picture. Um, so when do you do it? Here, here are some of the considerations. Day of the week, time of the day. Have to consider the weather. That's always a problem. You can't do it. You have to decide, I'm only going to do it on rainy days, or I'm only going to map good best days, which is usually the thing that you want to achieve, is to, to understand the intensity of use so you do it in a good weather day, but then you might have to consider winter, summer. Uh, in the F&B space, if you look at William White's work, uh, sunlight is a massive thing for sitting down in public spaces and shading. That's one of the key things. So that's going to be a consideration for your mapping to also perhaps map the reflection and the sunlight and the quality of the light and that you can actually measure quite systematically. Um, okay, and then you start to, to overlay this and see patterns. You can see here more than three persons walking, uh, how, how this, the use patterns there. There seem to be, in some of these mappings, uh, this was, was quite interesting because it actually has these circular ramps on the side um, on some of the floors, there's a bias towards using the one ramp and not the other ramp, which obviously you wouldn't know just through behavior mapping why that is. Um, okay. And then once you've collected all of this, these sheets, hundreds and hundreds of sheets, uh, in, in our exercise, student exercise, I, I actually used it as an opportunity to show them how to use basic GIS. So that's how we mapped this combined with AutoCAD. Uh, and then, so, so this is useful, but not that useful, actually, if you really want to understand how people use space. So we went deeper into another level. We're quite attracted by, by the way that Tiresh and Holger from Urban Works map, uh, map uh, their use of space in some studies. So uh, we actually did a workshop with them and, and asked them, can you really show us how to do this mapping? What are the things we need to look for? And, and this actually helps you to start to get it to, to the scale of that behavior setting, that thing, that, that room that pops up in a public space that people occupy, they protect, and they use, and that becomes a, a, a setting that you can map as an entity. Uh, and then you can start to combine it, for instance, with your observations in the behavior mapping. Uh, these are not the same, but just as an example. And then you can actually start to measure the sizes of the spaces as well. So here you can see in that space, 30% or 20% of it is chess area. Uh, most of it is actually trading or some trading, landscaped area and circulation. So if we think about, again, this space as all equal, we are spending 
most of it on circulation and landscaping, where we actually have a lot of other needs in, in the space that could be accommodated for. Um, and then when you combine, and this is, I guess, the, the point of this discussion, when you start to combine that, the data, with something that's a bit more accessible for people to, to understand and see, um, you come up with this visual representation, which we call the activity mapping. And it's hand-drawn. It's very low, low budget, um, a lot of work, though. Uh, but then you, you start to actually show what people are actually doing in space, and you have all the data to help you frame how you do this drawing. Uh, so the way these students did it was actually, they, they just had this whole, like an architectural office, all these different uh, uh, people configurations and people gestures and ways and, and objects that they could, could then um, uh, plug into the public space and move them around digitally. Uh, and if they needed more, they would just draw more. So, so then you get this representation that actually shows exactly what's happening in the public space, let's say in a time of high intensity. Um, then side boundaries. Here you can see it's quite an internalized space. It wasn't as important to actually map the adjacent streets. In Drill Hall, the contrast between the space itself and how it's protected as an enclave for children to, to play versus the crazy busyness of the streets surrounding it, and then also the interfaces of um, sort of the undesirables, as William White would call drug addicts or whatever, you know, sitting on the one side and then the kids on, in the center. So this became an important uh, geography to actually show in the drawing, and, and that's why we, or Murray actually extended the boundaries of this mapping. And then this one, I just wanted to show you the extent that you can go. Sarah de Villiers, her mapping of Baraguana taxi rank, that you can even do it at this scale. But this becomes really, really tricky. And then this is the kind of detail that, that you can get out of it. And then also quite important to do an activity section to translate that, uh, the 2D, into a 3D to start to get an idea of, of the cross-cut of the different uses in space. Then I want to just leave you with this, and actually we applied some of these space syntax techniques uh, in the studies. Uh, I think particularly for the F&B work, it can be quite important to think about the location of the security guards and their paths of visibility. Uh, because the security guards, the uh, police trucks, the police uh, people standing around, all these figures of authority that actually may influence uh, uh, people's behavior in space uh, just through, their, through seeing them. Uh, so this point isovist analysis can be, uh, can be applied from a single point, and it actually shows you, if you have all the thresholds drawn of the space, it shows you uh, what you can actually see, all the possible things in all directions that you can see. So I, I think this could be quite interesting to think about it in, in that sense. Okay, and then, then I'm leaving you with, with a few references so you can do Thanks. more reading. Thank you so much, Dan. <laughs> um, Dan, before we move into our, our smaller workshop session with the core team, um, would you be open to taking any questions yeah, from absolutely. the audience? Are there any questions from the... This, this is good. 1.30, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Bravo. <laughs> any questions? I have a question. Um, what software or what programs do you generally use other than sort of just your... You know, all of them. We have to use all of them. Photoshop, AutoCAD, hand drawing, uh, Illustrator, InDesign, GIS... Uh, what else? Uh, so that's in the kind of space syntax software. But in the when you're actually doing the field work, what? Uh, how do you actually physically map? Is it always through visual um, uh, sort of observations, or are you using like uh, any cap data capturing devices to do so? 
I always found, uh, I've used in the one study on Detroit, but it was very qualitative on how the idea was actually behind it, how students from other parts of the city, the northern parts of the city, how they perceive the inner city of Detroit. So we sent them in with video cameras, and we were actually reading or analyzing what they photographed as the important thing. How do they frame the camera? Um, most of it was actually drive-by by shooting, because they're too afraid to actually get out of the car. So, so there's a very, very specific way that body and camera interacts, and their perceptions actually drive that. Um, for this kind of mapping, uh, obviously William White used, used a video camera to actually capture the space, but that, then you end up with such a, a, a lot of data that would be really hard to convert into something else. Obviously nowadays you can, um, uh, they are using in behavior mapping now just a tablet, so, so it's, which, which I guess is sort of like GIS, so it's already mapped or geolocated which was exactly what I did with the tablet. So it was, it gave it a coordinate and I can just import it into GIS. But there are increasing uses of studies where they're using GPS tracking on the actual individual. So yeah. in hospital settings, for example, where Ex they're carrying exactly. GPS trackers yeah. or in, in school settings, that type of thing, where they're actually, yeah. the individual is carrying it. Yeah. How that then affects the observation because they know they're being monitored mm. is another question. Yeah. So that actually works well uh, they also do it with cell phones. I mean, I, I, I've actually had many of these fantasies and dreams to actually uh, tap into cell phone mapping. But I mean, you get stuck with around so many ethical issues. And actually, how do you, but I mean, that's a wonderful way of actually mapping, but that's, uh, that's very really useful for large scale use, like understanding movement across the city. Uh, whereas in a, in a public space, I, I just don't see the need for it because it's, it's, it's much more manageable. You know, you might run into more technological issues trying to use cell phone mapping in a small space than actually just doing it pen and paper. But that's, <laughs> maybe I'm just being conservative about it. In that case, I'd like to thank you all so much for, for joining us for the masterclass part of this session. Um, and we really hope that you'll come and join us for some of the future workshops as we go along through our research. Thanks again. Thank you so much.